Welcome to the finale of Barn Burner, the world's largest consumer pitch competition hosted by Sweater Ventures. The five finalists will be pitching their companies for a $500,000 investment from our panel of VC judges. After multiple rounds and tens of thousands of votes, these finalists beat out hundreds of other competitors for the chance to be here in Boulder, Colorado with you tonight. Five pitches, five judges, and one half million dollar reward. Who will come out on top? I'm your host, Adam Caton Holland. Let's get this barn burner started. Hello and welcome to the Boulder Theater for the Barn Burner Pitch Event. Brought to you by Sweater Ventures, everybody. We got an entire live theater here. Make some noise, everyone. Thank you so much for coming out. It's very nice to see all of you here tonight. We have five founders in backstage who have made it here tonight for the Barn Burners event. They beat out over 500 other startups. So some rounds of applause for the last five, five founders. Tens of thousands of votes were cast over the past month. A lot of input went into this. And as you all probably know, but I need to remind you, all of these founders are competing for a shot at $500,000, which as you know, can just be so, so helpful to a startup company like this. So everyone is very excited. We have an incredible panel of judges that I would like you all to meet. Uh, make some noise for your judges, everyone right here. I'm gonna ask each of the judges to tell us a little bit about themselves and their companies and what they do. So our first judge I'd like to introduce is Kara Morphew from Sweater Ventures. Welcome, Kara. Thank you. Hi, everybody. I'm Kara Morphew. I'm a partner at Sweater Ventures. As Jesse mentioned, we are a fintech platform that allows for anybody to invest in venture capital. Excited to be here. Excited to have you. Our next judge is Ryan Somerville from Antler. Welcome, Ryan. Yeah, thank you. So. Thank it's you. weird because you can't see them, but the at-home audience can see them. Yeah. Um, so I'm a partner with Antler. Antler is a global early stage VC. So our whole thesis is to back founders as the first check in the door and then be supportive throughout the whole life cycle of the venture. Awesome. Thank you for being here. Our next judge is Heath Butler from Mercury. Welcome, Heath. Can you tell us a bit more about Mercury? Thank you. Mercury is an early stage uh, venture capital firm based in Houston. We invest in uh, B2B software companies at the uh, seed and Series A stage. All right. Well, welcome to you as well. The noise for Heath. Now the audience here can't see, but the home audience can. Our next uh, judge is Lit from Liquidity, and Lit is wearing a mask because Lit, you're behind an anonymous meme account, and you're an angel investor. But I wanted to explain to the home audience what might be going on. But please say a few words about yourself. Yeah. Hey, I'm uh, Lit. I uh, make memes on Instagram, Twitter. Uh, angel invest into uh, early stage startups and love you know supporting founders at the earlier stages. All right, very good. Thank you for being here. <laughs> Last but certainly not least, we have Garrett Gilbertson from Sum Ventures. Welcome, Garrett. Hey, thank you so much, everyone. Uh, yeah, my name is Garrett. I am the founder and uh, managing partner of Sum Ventures. We are an early stage fund based in Los Angeles and Chicago. And much like our, our panelists, we really believe in actively working with our founders from the earliest stages, rolling up our sleeves and building communities of support around those founders alongside our capital. And I'm going to give a shameless plug real quick. In the past month alone, uh, Ear Green, uh, Dress X, and Champions Round all were featured in Forbes and TechCrunch. And we were early investors in those companies. And we're really excited because those founders have the grit, domain expertise, and passion, and the same qualities that these founders are going to display. So we're excited to be here and uh, happy to participate. Thank you. I, lo I love that. Make some noise for all the judges, everyone. They're going to have their work cut out for them tonight. Um, I think it's time to introduce the founders. That's who we're all here to see and they've fought so hard to make it to the stage today. We're gonna uh, show you a nice video we prepared introducing all of the founders. So please enjoy that, and I'll be back in a few minutes after the video, everyone. Thank you. On my journey here, I had like a pit in my stomach, but I was also excited. We were filming stuff, we were jumping up and down, trying to get into that mindset of being on a stage. I actually grew up right here in Boulder, Colorado, and so my life has gone full circle at this point because it's time to go back to my old stomping grounds to go visit my parents. Good to see you guys. Yeah. <laughs> Welcome back to Boulder. Oh yeah, and also to win $500,000. Well, when I showed up at the building, I was like, saw the Central Intelligence Agency, and I was like, what, 
what am I getting myself into? To be here in Boulder, Colorado at Sweater is an incredible culmination of efforts and waiting to get here. And we're just, you know, overwhelmingly excited. We thought about doing it, not doing it. And once we decided to do it, we went all in. Yeah. And that's how Sweat does. Our culture works. Mm. For me, uh, it's always zero or one. You know, I, I'm not interested in incremental change. I'm not interested in just being a, a cog in the machine. What does winning mean to me? <laughs> I like to win, Ben. <laughs> I can't wait to get on stage and to pitch in front of the whole audience. I just, it's going to be one of the best moments of my life and I can't believe that my parents are gonna be there in the audience to support me. My friends growing up from high school are gonna be there to support me. Winning this pitch competition is going to be life-changing. But a company like mine, we're underfunded. Oh my gosh, we're so underfunded. So winning this will give me relief. Winning means relief. <sighs> the butterflies are in my tummy, that's for sure. It's uh, very emotional, but very exciting at the same time. Should I do that again without like almost crying? I think my feeling overall being here is just really being grateful. Yeah, I feel like we are, we are ready. I feel good mm -hmm. about it, yeah. I think we'll do well. I feel very confident. Yeah, I'm gonna be a nervous freaking wreck on the inside, but I'm gonna play it calm, cool, and collected. You won't be able to tell a thing. That was great. How many of you know some, one of the founders here? How many people are here because you know people? All right, so everybody's invested in this. This is so exciting. Ooh, I'm nervous for everyone. Uh, yeah, we've been getting to hang out with these people all day, hanging out with the judges. Are you guys excited to see these people pitch? <laughs> Earlier they came out and did some practice pitches in front of the judges and had some weird ransom demands, but I think they're gonna be a bit more professional <laughs> in this next go around. How you feeling? Nervous as <laughs> So uh, without further ado, I'm going to introduce the first founder competing tonight, uh, the Boulder boy, hometown guy, Chris Wentz from Everkey, everybody. Welcome out here. Chris Wentz. Hello, Boulder! Chris, you said in the video you're, you're nervous inside, but you're going to appear calm, cool, and collected. Do you guys think he looks calm, cool, and collected right now? <laughs> Well, in a cruel twist, uh, you're here. You probably want to pitch. Too bad. We're going to a video package talking about you more. All right. Come over here and stand with me while we watch it. Right here. So I actually grew up right here in Boulder, Colorado. Um, I went to Fairview High School, um, go Knights, and uh, that's so cheesy. <laughs> I'm Chris Wentz. I am the founder of a company called EveryKey. We are on a mission to replace your passwords and keys. There's over $2 trillion lost every year due to password mismanagement. That's expected to grow to $10 trillion by the year 2025. So we have invented the world's first universal smart key that replaces those passwords and keys with this small, easy to use device. It's able to unlock everything from your phone to your laptop to the door to your office and more and log into all your website accounts when you're nearby and locks all that back down when you walk away. Just trying to make everybody's lives a lot easier and more secure. So we actually started every key in an entrepreneurship class. I have a computer science degree myself um, and my business partners. We're all engineers, um, but we were in this entrepreneurship class because I love the idea of starting a company. And uh, the professor asked us to come up with any kind of business idea we wanted, any product or service that could make money, but also make an impactful change on people's lives. So we came up with the idea for every key, presented it to the class, thought, wouldn't it be cool if Apple or Google were to do something like this? But fortunately for us, the professor shook our hands and said, guys, you should do this. You should make this a real company. I want to invest some money into this to make this a real company. And that gave us the confidence uh, and the push in the right direction that we needed to move forward. We've identified this huge problem within enterprises of password mismanagement, people writing passwords on pieces of paper, writing them on sticky notes, passing them around the office, uh, keeping them in plain text text documents. It's a real mess there. And we really need this money in order to move forward in that enterprise direction. This is gonna be a multi-billion dollar business. We just need a little bit of cash right now to get to that next step. 
When you invest into a business yourself, obviously it's only your own money that you can lose, but once other people start to invest into it, uh, now the stakes are higher. And so we certainly felt that pressure to perform. You always continue going, and if you ever feel like giving up, you're like, oh my God, I can't give up now because I don't want to let these people down. It was a huge motivator for us. I think we've accomplished a lot with very limited resources, but I still think that there's so much opportunity that has not yet been realized here at Every Key. And that's what I'm so excited about. I'm excited to see the future of this industry, of my company, of where things will go, because I think there's nowhere to go but up. That's Chris Wentz with Every Key, everyone. Chris Wentz, I want to wish you good luck, my friend. Thank you. It is your time to pitch. Go get them. OK. <clears throat> Hello, I'm Chris Wentz, and I'm a recovering gamer. When I was in middle school, I played a lot of video games, but I also created a lot of websites based off of those video games, tournament websites, advertising networks. And these websites, they made some money, but they more importantly taught me how to code and how to run a business. Fast forward to college. I presented an idea to my entrepreneurship professor, and it was a big idea, an idea that I thought, wouldn't it be cool if Apple or Google were to pursue this idea? But fortunately for me, the professor said, Chris, you should pursue this idea. I want to invest money in you and make this dream a reality. And tonight, Boulder, I want to tell you about that idea and the problem that we solve here at Every Key. The problem's a big one. It's one that everybody in this audience can relate to. Passwords and keys are insecure and inconvenient. I have this big bulky key ring that I have to take with me everywhere I go. I have hundreds of passwords, so many that I've had to write them all on sheets of paper like this. There's 500 of you in this audience tonight. That means that over 150 of you will have to reset a password tomorrow and that means that 400 of you are using passwords that have already been leaked to the public. Today, let's get rid of this broken and outdated access control technology and replace it with something better. Introducing the revolution of access control. Introducing every key, the world's first universal smart key that replaces your passwords and keys. When every key is close to your phone, your laptop, your tablet, the door to your office, your car door, your house door, your bike lock, or anything else that requires a key or password to unlock, every key unlocks that for you. It also logs you into all of your different website accounts and app accounts, social media accounts, email accounts, bank accounts, CRM systems, accounting software, you name it. Every key creates random and secure passwords for these accounts, logs you in automatically when you're around, and everything locks back down and logs back out when you walk away. We launched every key on Kickstarter and Indiegogo, the crowdfunding websites, and we broke the records on both of those platforms. But we didn't stop there. We shipped over 50,000 units and accumulated $3.2 million in revenue. OK. Back to gaming. You know how there's always a final boss at the end of the game, right? Well, we conquered that final boss first. Consumers are tough. They'll tell you everything that they love about your product, but they'll also tell you everything that they hate. And we learned a lot. We learned that we needed to make every key incredibly secure, so we added four layers of military-grade encryption we learned that we needed to make every key incredibly fast and responsive, so we made it connect in milliseconds, and it connects every single time. And fortunately for us, we received an issued US utility patent on this groundbreaking technology. This piece of paper, thank you. <laughs> this piece of paper right here has already generated over $650,000 worth of licensing revenue without even trying and we are just getting started. We will soon be launching Every Key Go, which will allow you to use your phone, your watch, or any other device 
as an every key. Remember back at the start of the presentation, I said that Apple or Google could copy this idea? Well, now I really wish they would. <laughs> Another thing we learned from all of these early customers was that a lot of them were early tech adopters. They're technologically savvy. They work for companies, and they're using every key in a corporate environment, many of them even in the IT departments. So we started to tackle the enterprise customer. And I'm happy to report that we now have LOIs and interests from LG Electronics, Mercedes-Benz, Saffron Aircraft, and dozens of others that are leaders in their industries. Our enterprise pipeline now exceeds over $100 million in annual reoccurring revenue, a $100 million ARR enterprise pipeline. <laughs> and we were just selected for a $1.25 million contract with the US Air Force. The US Air Force is going to use our technology to keep our great country safe. You know, since we're solving such a big problem here at EveryKey, we knew we had to start off by creating a world-class team, and I'm so fortunate to work with the people that I work with. Our management team now has three prior exits under our belt with companies valued in the billions, and our investors and advisors now include the former CEO and chairman of Mercedes-Benz, the former president of Chrysler and General Motors, the founder of the $4 billion company Cepheid, and the uh, first investor in both Twitter and Square. Welcome to the revolution of access control. Welcome to every key. Uh, one more thing. My pitch is done, but you all need to go change your passwords right now. So we have a little bit of a gift for you tonight. If you go to everykey.com, you can use discount code SWEATER50 to get 50% off your every key. It's the best offer we've ever given. You should take advantage of it. It's only good for one week. Thank you so much, Boulder. My name's Chris Wentz, and we're every key. Chris Wentz, everyone. Chris Wentz, everybody. Here you go, Chris. Oh, uh, thank you. <laughs> I, you know what? I don't really need these, do I? <laughs> Somebody just got a new car. <laughs> How many times did you practice that fire thing before you nailed it? Uh, I've done it a few times. I probably burned hundreds of pieces of it's flash paper. It's ah. like uh, magicians use it. I'd yeah. burn my eyebrows right <laughs> off. I, I did once for a, uh, a Shark Tank pitch, actually. Or not, not at Shark Tank, but yeah, like yeah, an yeah. application pitch. video. Well, yeah. that's just commitment to the game, man. <laughs> yeah. We're going to talk to the judges now. We want to hear your critiques, your feedbacks, any questions you have. Uh, judges, do you have anything you'd like to talk to, to Chris about? Yeah, happy to start. Um, first off, super impressive. Great job, Chris. Um, I just want to go a bit more granular on the, the traction and specifically the revenue so far. Like 100 mil and, and pipeline, brilliant, but it's, it's pipeline, right? At the, the risk of being the, the bad guy. Um, so of the 3.2 in lifetime revenue, how much of that is over the past year? And ballpark, what's the split enterprise versus consumer? Sure. So in 2021, we did about $400,000 in revenue. And then we more than doubled that in 2022. So we did about $850,000 in revenue. And I'm sorry, what was the second part of your uh, Yeah, question? just split uh, enterprise versus consumer. Oh, over yeah. The last so year. Uh, it, right now, most people are buying their every key and then using it in a enterprise environment. We don't necessarily keep track of exactly whether they're uh, signing up as an enterprise customer or signing up as a consumer, um, but we will be very soon. We're, uh, that's where we're at this pitch competition, actually, is to uh, finish developing the enterprise solution, uh, something where the enterprise can fully manage their every keys, and people will be specifically putting themselves into those buckets. OK, gotcha. And then um, on the licensing side, so pipeline aside, what's actually landed on the licensing so far? What's, what's booked revenue and who's oh, involved yeah. in that? So uh, licensing that $650,000 in revenue, that's money in the bank. That's not just uh, promises. And who's that um, from? So that's with three different companies. That's with uh, LG Electronics, the US Air Force, and uh, Global ID. So LG's written you a check just to be super Correct. Clear. Yes. Okay. Yes. Gotcha. Awesome. Thank you. I think it was a wire transfer. But. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Same principle. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Were there any other questions? Did yes, you have questions? Yes. Uh, yeah. Hi, Chris. Uh, 
Again, uh, lo- love the enthusiasm. I am familiar with what you've done because I saw you back in 2019, yeah. actually at the Band of Angels. Yeah. I wanted to ask a little bit about uh, the next iteration of Every Key because sure. I, I think what we've seen over the past few years is that the consumer adoption may, may not have been exactly what you had hoped for over the four years, and that's why you're going with Every Key Go on the software side. Could you speak to what needs to be developed on the software side and then give be a little bit more granular on the on your revenue projections and how much of that is Every Key Go? versus the hardware product? Yeah, yeah, great question. Um, so every key go on Android is completed. We just need to add a bit of a user interface to it. Every key go on iOS will come a little bit later this year. Um, we're developing it right now. Uh, and the second part of your question was... Uh, With your LOIs and in your expected revenue coming up, how much of that is based on the hardware product that you showed here tonight, and how much of that is based on the software uh, uh, solution? Right. Um, okay. So the there's certain environments where they need a hardware product, right? The U.S. Air Force. I have the contract right here, uh, the MOU uh, from the U.S. Air Force. Uh, they want the hardware product because uh, they can't let their users, their military members, uh, install something on their phones. They want a separate hardware product. Um, and then there's many others that uh, want the software product. It's about 50-50. There's a little bit more of an interest in the software product. So uh, probably around 60-40%. Thank you. Judges, we good? Please make some more noise from Chris Wins from Everkey, everyone. Great job, great job. Thank you, guys. Chris, you're free to hang out backstage until the end of the show or go to the alley and practice more magic tricks, whatever you prefer. That went so much better than I expected it God. to. Oh. I was so nervous leading up to it, but once you're out there and you've got the audience and people are applauding you and everything, it's so cool. It's so, like a dream come true. Oh my God, I'm gonna cry right now. If somebody knows CPR here in case I totally flip out, <laughs> I would be appreciate that because I might die. Are you guys ready to meet your next founder? We're going to show a video as a, as a means of introduction. Please enjoy this package about Eric Alvarez from Grapefruit Health, everyone. I read this book recently called the, the Gap and the Gain, and it's like about focusing on where you started and where you are versus like focusing on the ideal. And the ideal for me is Grapefruit Health. Like we want to get to a million students and save millions of lives. Am I where I want to be eventually? No. But if I focus on where I really came from, yeah, I'm proud of that. I'm Eric Alvarez from Chicago, Illinois. I'm the CEO and proud founder of Grapefruit Health. We're really addressing the massive staffing shortage in healthcare today. My first company, I was 13 years old, did oil changes at people's homes. So I'd take a wagon with all my supplies, not, not a red flyer, but like a, a natural kind of professional wagon. And in high school, you know, college was never on the, on the docket. My dad painted houses. My mom was like kind of a teacher's assistant and uh, joined the military. So I was in the Air Force. That gave me the discipline I needed to really take care of all those other things and gave me the drive really. So I got a whole bunch of education, including my master's degree in healthcare administration. Now I have the privilege to sit on faculty there today and I work with tons of clinical and non-clinical students. And then in 2015, joined the startup as the chief operating officer and first employee. And we grew that over five years and we were acquired by a very large electronic medical record company. And so it was really the convergence of those three experiences, um, healthcare education, healthcare administration, healthcare entrepreneurship that led to really Grapefruit Health coming to fruition. We're short by 3.2 million healthcare workers, which is the population of Los Angeles. And people are literally dying because they don't have access to healthcare, our most vulnerable populations. And so solutions out there today are things like recruiters and travel nurses and, and staffing platforms. But the problem is, is that they're just moving a finite amount of resources around and driving transitions of employment and charging a premium to do so. So they're driving up costs and reducing productivity. At Grapefruit Health, what we're doing is creating the first national workforce composed only of and completely of clinical students that we recruit, train, and manage onto our technology platform so they can perform work for healthcare organizations remotely. There are one million students pursuing clinical education today, from medical assistants to nursing students to social work, pharmacy. So it's the opportunity to create one billion new patient touch points every single year. We've had a lot of you know, trial and error and experimentation, and we have a long way to go. But I think when we do this right, it's a win-win-win. The students get to learn while they earn, patients now get the care they desperately need, and healthcare organizations can do what they need to do for less. 
what we're doing is like absolutely critical. Like it's gonna save millions of lives. It's not a nice to have. Like this is a real opportunity to make a real impact for a lot of people. And so I think just because the problem is so significant and that I think we have a, a real solution that we've tested and proven that it works, by investing in us, it allows us the runway to do the experiments that we need to build, measure, and learn for this to become a scalable business. And so instead of uh, will this work or not kind of investment, I think for us it's more can we do more with this money. My dad's from Puerto Rico. We didn't have a lot of anything growing up, you know, kind of paycheck to paycheck. And so to come from there to where I'm at now is recently named like alumni of the year and I've got to do some really cool things. I want to continue to be proud. And I think the way for me to do that is to, to achieve uh, success with Grapefruit Health. Please make some noise for Eric, everyone. <laughs> Eric Alvarez, Grapefruit Health. I love that. What a great backstory video. Thank you very much. Yeah. Are you yeah. feeling good? You feeling ready? Uh, it's going to be a hard act to follow. I don't know any magic tricks, but <laughs> I'm uh, excited to do my best. Well, I'm excited to hear your pitch, and it is that time, so good luck to you. Have at him. All right. Thank you so much. Hello, Boulder. Uh, my name is Eric Alvarez. I'm the proud CEO and founder of Grapefruit Health. And the problem we're addressing is this massive staffing shortage in healthcare that you just heard about, this 3.2 million healthcare worker gap, which is the population, again, of Los Angeles. And the solutions that are out there today that are trying to solve for this are things like recruiters, travel nurses, um, staffing and gig platforms. But we all agree that the number of workers that are out there is defined. And so really what those solutions are doing are moving the pieces around which is a zero-sum game at best, but it's actually a net negative-sum game because when you uh, transition employment, you lose productivity and they charge a premium for those services. They're not saving the lives of the 265,000 people who die every year due to the healthcare workforce shortage. And so at Grapefruit Health, we're thinking outside the box. In fact, we've blown up the box completely. We're creating the first workforce ever composed completely of and only of clinical students that we recruit, train, and manage onto our technology to perform work for healthcare organizations remotely. And so how does this whole thing work? Well, we built our own technology from the ground up, a web application that we cutely called The Grove, because that's where grapefruits grow. And on one side is the clinical student. These are the one million folks who are pursuing clinical education in our country today. These are medical assistants, nursing students, social work, pharmacy, pre-med students. They log into The Grove around their schedule, they click a button that says generate an interaction. We match them to patients based off things like culture, proximity, language is spoken, because the literature tells us that when we do that, the patient outcomes are far better. And on the other side of the application are healthcare organizations. These are health systems, hospitals, insurance companies. They're able to now accomplish the work they need to do and do it in far greater quantity for less while building these unique and novel talent pipelines because guess what? We want them to recruit our students as they near graduation. So the students get to learn while they earn. We charge these healthcare organizations a dollar amount per interaction. Those interactions are typically telephonic connections between a student and a patient to accomplish a task that is being done today by a licensed clinician so that they can operate at the top of their uh, license. And we also ch uh, charge in order to recruit our students into those organizations. And guess what? This crazy idea is actually working. We've secured over $200,000 in non-dilutive funding, including a $100,000 grant from Google, who believes in us strongly. We've reached revenue, and we've built a $6 million pipeline. Again, all of this in just one year. And we're on track to do $250,000 this year in revenue and $1 million in revenue next year. And we are the team to get this done. Again, I'm the CEO and founder. I grew up in Chicago, as the video mentioned. Blue collar family, college was never on the docket. Decided to join the United States Air Force as a uh, aircraft mechanic during Iraqi freedom. And that again, gave me the discipline to get this education. And uh, went over to, uh, got my master's degree at Rush. It's a top five master's degree in, in uh, healthcare administration. And I have the privilege there to now sit on faculty where I get to work with clinical and non-clinical students, which is how I came up with the idea for Grapefruit Health. From there was years of hospital administration and eventually into entrepreneurship as the first hire and chief operating officer. So I played the sport once before, um, and that was the convergence of those three experiences between healthcare education, healthcare administration, 
healthcare entrepreneurship that let Grapefruit Health come to fruition, pun intended, uh, on that one um, there. And so what's really exciting about all of this is the impact. What can we really do? And when you operationalize a brand new workforce of one million clinical students, we're addressing an $18 billion market. But what gets us out of bed out of in the morning is that we can generate 1 billion net new patient touch points, save healthcare workers 35 million hours a year, better train, better prepare our future clinicians for this country while making healthcare more affordable. And $500,000 to us as a one-year-old company is very significant. This gives us the runway we need and funds us through all of 2024, allows us to make one key hire internally while hitting the rest of our financial uh, uh, key, key milestones. And so with that, I leave you with this. Grapefruit Health is not a nice to have. This isn't an entertainment product or anything of that nature. We are imperative. This business model needs to be deployed so that we can fix healthcare. So we ask you to please invest in us so that we have the opportunity to save millions of lives. Thank you very much. Great job. Congratulations. Yeah. Eric Alvarez. Uh, we're going to pivot to the judges. Do you guys have any questions or, or comments? Uh, anything for Eric? Yes, Eric, uh, great job. I really love how you've identified a net new workforce to uh, attack this problem that's affecting all of us. So, so congrats on that. Um, tell us more about how you qualify the labor pool and what portion of these one million workers um, will meet the, the needs and the requirements of your healthcare customers. Yes, absolutely. Great question. And so. When we say a clinical student, we say anyone pursuing clinical education, and so we get to that number of a million. But there are certain student types that I think are better fit for what we really do. And so that number comes down closer to 700,000 or so um, on there, and that's made up of nursing and other students that are kind of pursuing education in the four to seven year range so that we can utilize their output for a longer portion of time. And then how do we qualify these students? The students apply. And about 60% of that application process is automated today. We would like to make that closer to 90%. We get to be very selective because we're overwhelmed right now with student interest. And our product market fit, something that we can say very confidently, is the interest of the student and the student's ability to perform. We feel very, very confident in, in doing those things. And then it's your standard, maybe not standard, but your background check. We go through a lot of training modalities with them. They must do at least one clinical rotation prior. And they have to have a high GPA. So it sounds like uh, grapefruit to uh, uh, Uber meets uh, match.com. That sounds good to me. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Eric. Thanks. Eric Alvarez, Grapefruit Health, right, everybody. Thanks, everyone. Are you guys having fun? That's awesome, man. You are great on stage. If this doesn't work out, you can be an actor. <laughs> How do you feel? Oh, I feel so much better. As, uh, as part of the previous week, all of the founders worked with professional pitch coach uh, Robbie Crabtree and Sweater filmed a little video showing all that, so we're going to watch that before we bring out the next pitch, everybody. Enjoy. So good to see you. What's happening? Just made it in. Thank you. Yeah. Hi, you Lindsay. Lindsay. Chris. So nice to Great meet you. Great to meet you. Hi. So nice to meet you. Nice. Thank you. Welcome. We decided to bring all of the founders to Boulder a week ahead of the show so they could work with a professional storyteller to really dial in their pitches. Um, but let's get set up in here. We have about nine, eight or nine minutes. Hi, I'm Robbie Crabtree. I'm the founder of Competitive Storytelling. I used to be a trial lawyer where I tried 102 jury trials. What I realized in that world was the best story wins. What I realized later was the same is true in the startup world especially with founders who are going out there to raise venture capital. So what I do these days is I work with founders to help them figure out what their story is and then how best to share that with investors to get them on board and say, hey, I want to be a part of this future. Chris came in from Every Key and immediately you could see the energy in him. The first thing he shared, personal story, right out of the gate. Even when you say like, we just actually signed a 1.25 million contract with the Air Force. The Air Force is going to be using Every Key to make sure everything that they do is safe and secure. And you just did that first try perfectly, whereas when I was in front of the camera, <laughs> Mistakes, 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 mistakes. Eric with Grapefruit is addressing something that we all know is a huge problem, which immediately checks a box. Now, one of the things that stood out in my first initial conversation with him was 
who's very focused on logic and facts. The groups you meet with, they sort of make their decision, I think, before you go on stage based on how like investable you are, what's your traction, what's going on there. They're trying to figure out, are other people gonna be excited? Are they gonna be able to talk to investors in the future? Are they going to be able to tell the story in a way that really great talent wants to join the team, even when they don't necessarily make a ton of money in those early days? So Laura and Mandy came in the day two, absolutely prepared, ready to go. They had their script down, they had their parts down, they were asking how they should stand and hold their hands because they were being really intentional in how they want to show up. One of my main takeaways is what when we get on that stage, we're gonna feel the anxiety rush in, the adrenaline rush in, and we're gonna rush without knowing it. So he said always go at 50%, 70% of the speed that you are called to do. First run was a little bit rusty, it was a little bit long. Uh, we talked about it for like 30 minutes. I mean, I would think something as simple as engagement. I'm like, who here has ever been to a farmer's market? Exactly, that's exactly what I was thinking. <clears throat> yeah. All right, man, this was great. You know, our, our business has this ability to elicit emotion, and we have, you know, some key characters I think we can bring in to help do that. I'm excited. Yeah. 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 Got your work cut out ahead of you. I got my work cut out, man. Oh my gosh, Robbie. I did not know what to expect. I was blown away by Robbie. Absolutely blown away. What is the six figures? That thing is low, it's like 200K, so. But stop, like, stop telling yourself that narrative. Okay, okay, okay. You bootstrapped to $200,000. How many, how many skincare companies could, could say that they bootstrapped to $200,000 and ran super lean and got A16 to, to back them? I think sometimes when you grow and grow and grow and you're competing against people who have VC money and then you consistently hear, like, you don't have enough, you start to believe that you don't have enough. So yeah, the founders worked really hard for a few days on improving their pitches, and during that time, there was a lot of unexpected interaction between the founders. Henry, Henry's my favorite, and I'll say that boldly. Yes, I met with Esne. Um, she was awesome. Uh, it was great chatting with her. Did you I add mean, me? Yeah, I did add okay, you. Good. It's okay. Even if you don't accept me, I add you again. <laughs> <laughs> get, the, get the burner account. <laughs> uh, it was great chatting with her. Uh, we had a lot of uh, shared interests. But Henry has been my favorite founder to talk to. I've probably spent the most time. We only talked for like five minutes. Everyone's been working, so we're all working. So we haven't had a chance to really like commune. Um, so I've only really spoken to Henry and one of the team members from Everkey every key so consciously i'm not trying to remember anyone's name <laughs> uh i think that uh, this is all good fun i love the competitive nature of of what the barn burner represents um and yeah we're we're, we're here to win so today is the day before the show and that means it is dress rehearsal day at this dress rehearsal for the first time our founders are pitching in front of these judges and seeing what works and what doesn't Ready? Feeling good? Yes. I can tell that everyone's nervous. I'm happy we did this. Yeah, like actually thrown up after drinking yeah, this morning. Is it I think like it's, nerves or is it the altitude? I think or? it's come both. So after running through the pitches, um, feeling more prepared? Yeah, it definitely feels more confident. Yeah, we got nice feedback like expression-wise. We had a joke. They laughed. <laughs> I think I was pretty nervous while I was presenting to the judges today in dress rehearsal. So I, my hands may have been shaking a little bit and I was really hoping that they couldn't pick up on my nervousness. Hold out your hand. Yeah. Oh my goodness, look at that. <laughs> Actually, if I don't stop it, it'll get Mine was 10 minutes ago. <laughs> yeah. I don't know if that's good. I played it like a little bit close. I like, I definitely like didn't play my full hand. Like I wanted to save some of those more like emphatic, punchy one-liners. Yeah, I feel like the energy is, 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 is top notch right now. All in all, I am really happy with the run through. Yeah, I think everyone did a fantastic job and I can't wait to see them do it live. I was truly blown away by how the founders showed up this week. All of their pitches in the end exceeded expectations. They've worked so, so hard. I'm, I'm so excited to see how they perform tomorrow and I'm gonna be really sad on Wednesday when I wake up and they're not there to talk to every five minutes.
This is really cool to see how much work has gone into tonight, so we really appreciate it. Are you guys ready to meet your third founder? Well, please give a nice welcome to Ezene Irawanya from Skin Muse, everyone. Okay, it's giving. Yes! Hello, Volta. <laughs> they like you already. I know. <laughs> Before we show your video, I do want to ask what it was like working with Robbie. Was that a fun experience? Oh my gosh. Um, I'm probably going to stalk Robbie for the rest of my life. Uh, <laughs> That's illegal. <laughs> Shh. <laughs> Robbie was exceeded every expectation I had. I never even knew that we would have so many things in common. We have the same favorite author. Um, so Who's that? Chimamanda Adichie. She's oh. actually a Nigerian um, author. Very yes, cool. yes, 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 yes. Thank yeah, you. Yeah, well, I'm sure that was very valuable learning <laughs> yes. how to pitch with, with Robbie. Um, <laughs> let's just let's just show your video and learn more about Skin Muse, everyone. Okay. Enjoy. Yes. Who am I? I'm a ball of sunshine. I radiate high energy. <laughs> When I was a child, my mom always said, self-care is something that you deserve, not something that you have to earn. My company lowers the entry barriers when it comes to accessibility to self-care. My name is Izane, and I'm the founder of Skin Muse. We are a premium beauty brand that champions inclusivity in luxury beauty. When you think of luxurious experiences, whether it's a stay at a hotel or access to certain spaces, it's usually exclusively old wealth. Nobody is catering to the modern day consumers who are young millennials, Gen Z, who really prioritize mental health. So my company, we use beauty to give you 30 minutes of self-care a day. You might not be able to go on a vacation tomorrow. You might not be able to book a ski trip in Aspen, but you can take my fragrances, my body butters, my body oils, the playlist that we create with each product and create this beautiful experience for yourself every day. Using Skin Muse equates to like a happier life in the long term because you spend some time with yourself every day. I'm in Colorado Boulder. <laughs> I'm pretty sure I'm going to be pitching in front of people who most likely might not look like me. You have to get your mind ready where it's like, I know what I'm worth. I know what I am building. You have to have to fortify yourself and stand in your truth, knowing that if you do, the world will make room for you. And the more I've built this company and even having meetings, there's a lot of education that goes into calls when you're speaking to the normalcy of old white men. But a lot of people in this space do not, you know, want to educate themselves, which is their responsibility. So you see founders like me having to do that, having to educate, having to advocate, having to be compared to that one meeting they had with that other black founder, which is ridiculous, and having to really overcome that. It's like a mental health battle all the time. The mental gymnastics, I wish I didn't have to do. I wish I didn't have to double think each time I went to a meeting. Are you going to hear me and see me for me and accept all of me? I'm a bright personality. I'm not bland. I know that. It comes with my experience. It comes with my culture of life, right? Are you going to hear that? Are you going to receive that? Will you not be intimidated by how bright I shine? Half a million dollars is 18 to 24 months of runway for us. We're literally launching into 40 hotels at the end of the year. That will literally be able to get us in those spaces without having to worry, will we be bankrupt by September? This could be the catalyst to pivot us and 10X our revenue in two years. It's a very tricky place to be an underrepresented founder. I'm someone who understands that from the beginning of your company, it's more than you. Now I want to be as big as Louis Vuitton, Moe, Hennessy, Estee Lauder, and I'm going to get there. But winning this is not going to be just a skin use win. I promise you, at least <laughs> 10 other companies are going to feel this impact. My journey through life, born and raised in Nigeria, moved to America by myself at 16. By myself. There was no mom, no dad, by myself. Gone to college at 16. 
So I'm in University of Oklahoma, studying for petroleum engineering and dealing with having to be different, but also having to exceed. It is my greatest blessing to have people believe in my dream so much that they are willing to devote, invest, and sacrifice for it. I have like a village of aunties at home that I call every time I win something and they all get excited. My mom, she like glimmers every time she sees what I do. Um, never in her wildest dreams could she have imagined <laughs> that I'd be here doing this. You know, you can only dream about things that you know. I'm reckless in my dreaming and I don't let my mind limit my destiny. These are things that some of people who come from where I come from have only imagined and seen on TV. To see somebody such in a close degree have these accomplishments inspires them. And that's why I'm proud of myself. Ezene Irawanya of Skin Muse. You ready to pitch? Good luck to you. Thank you guys. Okay, before I begin, I want to make sure everybody in this room knows how to say my name. Let's do it together. Ezene. Okay, we can begin. So at 16, I migrated from Nigeria to the University of Oklahoma for my American dream. I found myself in a foreign culture. I had the responsibility of an adult but the authority of a child. I was so bold, but so afraid, so excited, but oftentimes homesick. In those moments of sadness and feeling away from home, I went back to my mother's beauty routines. My mom used to spend time with her buddy butters and fragrances, and that made me start mimicking that routine. It gave me some warmth. It made me feel like I had a piece of home away from home. It was beautiful. At 18, I got my work permit from the American government. <laughs> and immediately, my first job was as a perfumer at Dillard's. Shortly after, <laughs> I know, shortly after, I became a national stylist for Lancome. And years later, I became a business manager for Dior. As I ascended in this industry, I was still making those body butter products. Not because I wanted to, but because I really needed to. You see, up until now, my beauty experiences has consisted of weird back alley visits, looking for ingredients that were kind of similar to what I was used to at home. Every time I would go through TXA, TSA, I would have this anxiety because I didn't know if these products would make it through to the airplane. Most of the time, they did not, and I'd be sitting on the plane upset because now I have to use the hotel lotion, which we all know isn't really lotion. <laughs> so I'm thinking to myself, if I'm dealing with this, how many other people are dealing with this? And then I did my research. Did you know that minority consumers spend about $4 trillion? Black women alone spend $8 billion just on beauty. Every year, that is twice as much as everybody else. So I'm thinking, there's an oversight here. Someone's not paying attention. This simple oversight became my product market fit. And that's why we launched Skimuse. Skimuse is a premium beauty brand leveraging cultural practices for the new age consumer. We simply lowered the access barrier to luxury self-care and beauty. Our brand sits at the intersection of um, culture, community, and access. In just over two years, we've been able to bootstrap to a quarter of a million dollars. We've launched online on Macy's. We're rolling out in 40 hotels with a thousand more on the horizon. And just recently, we found out that we will be the premier beauty brand launching with Diddy on his new luxury marketplace called Empower Global. Yes! <laughs> but that's not just it. Our cuticle oil is ranked top 10 by LUSA. Our perfume oil is reminiscent of a modern day Chanel number no. five. And our body butter, mm. our customers call it a warm hug. One of the things that I love about our customers is that they're so opinionated. They'll tell you what they're thinking. And it's because we are competing in a very, very competitive space with industry veterans. 
Now, one of my favorite customers is Cindy. Cindy loves the fresh perspective that we bring. Cindy thinks that our text line is her personal chat line. So Cindy is constantly engaging all the time. Cindy saves up for skin you sets every quarter. She shares it with her nephews, her nieces, her friends. Cindy is like a walking, talking billboard. I should actually pay Cindy, actually, when I think about it. <laughs> and because we target the most loyal consumer base, we've been able to maintain a 50% retention rate at a $3 CAC. The possibilities are endless in this space. Now, we have the capacity to use that to take 100 billion from the travel industry and 22 billion just from beauty alone, which would put us on track to become the apple of body care by 2025. Yes, I like the side. <laughs> Already, we are 22% clinically better than our top competitor. We have a really strong partnership with American Express and the Dream Hotel. We've been featured by Beyonce <laughs> and Issa Rae in Vogue. Issa Rae explains us as the brand that you'll never want to return. Um, before I close out, though, I want to highlight my amazing team. Collectively, we come with over 40 years of experience in beauty and fashion. We've walked, worked and launched brands like Katy Hilton, um, Tommy Hilfiger, Louis Vuitton. Our advisor is the ex-CMO of Glossier. Together, we also launched a social impact initiative that sponsors therapy sessions for kids in need. We do about 50 plus a year. And before, I know some of you might be thinking, it's just beauty, but there's a reason why the beauty industry is recession proof. Everybody here actually interacted with beauty before you came in. You all look beautiful, by the way. <laughs> um, so I want to challenge you to think big. The new age consumer is already seeking for change. I don't want you to get left behind like um, Blackbuster, Blackberry, or Victoria's Secret. I want you to be bold and make an investment in Skin Muse as we build the apple of beauty. Thank you very much. Keep it going for SNA Skin Muse. Great job. Judges, questions, feedback, critiques. Yes, uh, wonderful job, first of all. I love that you're adding a experience component to your product offering. Um, so my question is, over the past few years, we've seen you know, a lot of retail and D2C companies go through some obstacles with their supply chains. How, can you tell us a little bit more about your supply chain and how you plan to scale it as you phase, goes through this next phase of growth? Good question, thank you very much for that. Um, fortunately, we thought this was a bad thing when we first started. We actually own and operate our entire operation vertical, from sourcing to formulation, distribution and fulfillment. Um, we were forced to do this because we couldn't find anything in the market that could do it for the price that we wanted in the time span that we were launching. So we actually have our own operations factory in California and we plan to use some of this investment to continue um, keeping the lights on there as well. This helps us get ahead when people are selling out and not being able to source what they need. We have a direct supplier all the way in West Africa, Nigeria, in Dubai, and in America as well. Um, one of our social impact initiatives is also sourcing um, talent from local businesses and small businesses like mine as well. So it keeps us ahead where we have a really good and strong relationship with the people that we work with, yes. Isn't it on your Skin Muse, everyone. Great job. You can go ahead and wait backstage. That was our first half. Stay tuned. We'll be back with plenty more of the Barn Burner Pitch event after this short break. It was so quick. I was like, oh my gosh. I'm like, oh, did I really finish the whole pitch? I, could, I was like, wait, I'm pretty sure I'm missing something. Oh my gosh, oh my gosh. But I think I did everything. Okay, go ahead. I think you did. Okay. You oh. killed it. Let's go. <laughs> Welcome back to the Barn Burner, second half. We have two more pitches to get to. We're having so much fun here in the Boulder Theater. Make some noise, Boulder Theater. 
Hope you're having as much fun at home, but I doubt it. But thank you for joining us regardless. We are just going to get into the pitches and show another Founders video. Uh, please give a nice uh, round of applause to this next video about Salar Shahini and Mandy Joe's Sweat Pals. We'll define the era where technology is truly empowering us and making authentic connection. Establishing experiences that are good for our well-being, you come alive and the city comes alive. You have things to do, you have places to go, you feel better, you look better. Through moving our bodies and doing something great for our mind and body. Imagine everyone in the world having that and how transformative that would be. My name is Salar Shahini. I am founder and CEO of Sweat Pals. My name is Mandy. I am a co-founder and CPO at Sweat Pals. We connect you to the local fitness and wellness events and communities happening around you. I moved from Iran to the U.S. when I was 20. And in my grad, in grad school, I worked on an application and we, we spun it out as a company. And as part of that job, I was CTO of that company for, for about seven years. And I, I had to travel all the time. I traveled to 250 cities in two different countries. And I always had this problem. Where are all these run clubs? Where are all these, where do I find people to find that connection? Because going to bars and nightclubs for me is not very natural. So I met my co-founder in one of these trips that, that I had in Montreal, actually. And she had amazing portfolio. I moved to the US when I was 14 years old. One of the biggest events I had during high school was I started to develop psoriasis. Uh, it's a skin condition. I had it all over my body right now. I still have some on my arm and it destroyed my self-esteem and confidence at the time. At the same time, I still, I couldn't speak English and it was hard for me to make friends already. So it was a tough start. And to cure the psoriasis, I tried all the remedies I can think of at the time. None of these really helped, um, but randomly I discovered that if, if I ex expose my skin under the sunlight or if I sweat a lot, it actually helped improving my condition little by little. So I joined all the school teams at the time just because I wanted to just cure my skin and I knew that was my solution at the time. It did help my skin a lot, but most importantly, I learned my English from my team, <laughs> obviously, and I found my family here. They're my first community, and um, through this experience, I gained so much confidence, and I found that there's a support system for myself, and got a lot stronger, <laughs> and believing in myself, and knowing that whatever I set my mind to, I can always conquer it was the support of my community at the time. It's very inspiring to see her hard work and also always willing to learn. And yeah, I wouldn't have asked for a better co-founder. I think this is a this is a powerhouse. She's a powerhouse, yeah. Coming from a different country. Uh, it's, you know, I always had the cultural difference, the language difference, but if you think about it, fitness doesn't matter. You're in the same class, different people, different backgrounds. Not only get their favorite workout done, playing volleyball or doing the cool plunge with a bunch of people, whatever it is, they always find the most meaningful, genuine connection with people they never met. You're all high-fiving each other, working towards the same goal, building camaraderie. There's nothing like it. Let's go on a run and then grab something to eat. Let's go to this cool yoga club and then afterwards do the happy hour. And that's, that was always my way of meeting people. And we want Sweat Pals to give that gift to everyone. We've been having a lot of great feedback. We launched in Austin last year and people love us. Half a million dollars means Miami, means uh, San Diego, means Denver, Boulder. That's definitely where we want to go. We want to take Swap House to many more cities and bring it to everyone. So because of the scale that we can do this and the impact we will have personally on people and community-wise, I think we deserve to win. There was a run event and there was this girl who came in a little late and I could tell she wanted to connect with people because there was an icebreaker at the beginning, but she was late and people were already engaged. But by the end of the run, I saw her just talking with everyone and she was one of the last people and you couldn't believe this is the same person. 
and she just was beaming with excitement, confidence, and just imagine everyone in the world having that. I see these stories happening every day, just like how I came through what I did with my high school and my fitness community helped me in high school. It happens every day because of Sweat Pals. I'm really proud of how much we've done so far and really excited to see what's next for us. Please welcome Salar Shahini and Mandy Joe from Sweat Pals, everyone. You ready? All right, well, good luck to both of you. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Imagine a world where people don't connect through screens, but through sweat. Welcome to Sweat House, where we're transforming the way people bound one workout at a time. I'm Salar, and this is my co-founder, Mandy. When I moved to the United States, I had a really hard time connecting with people because of the cultural and language differences. And I tried everything. I tried going to bars and nightclubs, which is not very natural for me, but that's what everyone said I should do. I tried posting in Facebook groups. I've tried things I am too embarrassed to say. <laughs> <laughs> that all changed once I discovered a running club and a rock climbing community. All of a sudden, I had many friends. I had things to do that I loved. And not only the city came alive for me, but I came alive. I quickly then realized that fitness is one of those few areas in life where it doesn't matter where you are from, what's your religion, if you have an accent, we are all in this together, working towards something bigger. You might not know this, but there are over 700,000 of these communities in the US alone. And it's been growing more rapidly than ever post-pandemic. In-person group activities is the number one growing trend in fitness right now. There are so many people looking to bond over experiences that doesn't involve waking up the next day with a hangover. So, <laughs> so why isn't there a platform that connects us to them? On the flip side, those community leaders are also struggling to be discovered by people like us. Truth is, if you're running your own fitness or wellness communities, it's no different than running your own business. Community leaders today have to, run, have to work as a marketer, content creator, business development while stitching together multiple tools for payments, email lists, liability waivers. Before you know it, admin duties like this take so much time that you have no time left to do what you love. And because of that, so many people give up on building their dream communities. But does it really need to be this frustrating? That's why we built Sweat Pals, so fitness and wellness community leaders have all these tools in one place, building, growing, and monetizing your community finally feels like a breeze. Our users love us. In just five months, in Austin alone, we onboarded more than 8,000 users and over 200 communities onto the Swap House app. We're expanding to Miami because people there are reaching out and they want Swap House there. We already have communities in LA using Swap House, and we set our eyes on Boulder as our next destination. <laughs> And our users can't get enough. We have over 63% monthly retention across all users. Sweatpals creates authentic connections. And we are proud to announce we just had our first Sweatpals engagement. Wow. My <laughs> <laughs> Michael and Maddie, two amazing, incredible humans, very active. They met on Sweatpals a few months ago, and the spark was so strong that they are now engaged. <laughs> And we have 92% monthly retention on those community leaders. Laura, who's running a successful breathwork community in Austin, has seen three times more revenue since using Sweat Pals. Sweat Pals isn't just a fitness app, it's a movement, connecting people like never before. Just like LinkedIn, it will be the destination for all fitness and health interactions. Our revenue model combines transaction fees and subscriptions from those members and partnerships from the brand and communities, monetizing both sides of this thriving marketplace. In last month alone, we generated more than 15K in GMV and more than 12K in revenue so far. We are breaking into a $32 billion market, and this is just the beginning. And we've assembled a rock star team. 
I'm a successful serial founder and a former CTO. I'm an experienced product expert delivering products to Fortune 500 companies. And we have an all-star team of advisors and investors who have had successful exits to Meta, Airbnb, and Uber, including two of our own users who became so passionate about SweatPals, they are two of our biggest investors. Envision SweatPals as a global platform for all things fitness and wellness, seamlessly connecting you to any fitness and wellness communities in any part of the world. Picture yourself in your city, experiencing the city with a new run club you just discovered on SweatPals, or hiking through a secret trail in LA from a new hike club. Even in Bali, you'll find Acro Yoga partners ready to jam with you. We've built a proven playbook to spread Sweat Pals first nationwide and then worldwide. We start by partnering with local fitness and wellness communities who will use Sweat Pals as their operating system and bring on their members. We leverage network effects through in-person and digital activations. We believe that everyone deserves the gift of community. With your investment, we can spread this gift worldwide, ensuring that no matter where you are, you always belong. Thank you. Thank you. Keep it going for Salar and Mandy, everyone. Great job. Judges, do your thing. Awesome. Hey, great pitch, guys. One of the things that I, I really loved about getting to know you yesterday and, and uh, hearing from the pitch is, is your personal connection to the pain point that you're solving, being able to uh, uh, you know, express how you w were solving the problem that you uh, uh, essentially wanted to uh, or experienced yourself uh, when you first arrived here. And on top of that, I think that being immigrant founders and, and coming to the U.S., showing that grit and determination is really impressive. So just hats off to you on that front. Now for the feedback piece I, and, and for the question. I think that the uh, process of launching one city in Houston, you've done a great job. You've done a great job in Houston. You've got 8,000 members. You have high engagement. Although scaling that across the country is a much more difficult task, right? Uh, I would like to hear how you plan on doing that more granularly and what KPIs you're specifically tracking to accomplish that goal. And then lastly, you know, if we invest our money into you, one of the things that we're concerned about on this side of the table is ensuring that you don't run out of money. And this is a capital intensive business that you're running. So what are those next milestones that you're going to achieve to ensure that you're able to raise capital at a higher valuation or become profitable? I'll yeah, absolutely. Uh, so the first part of the question, the our playbook is that we, so in Austin, the way we, we, we were the city managers in Austin, but the, the way we're gonna structure it is similar to how Uber did in the early days, where we're gonna have you know, city manager in each city that's gonna curate that experience and onboard that local app, uh, or local app experience for, for those communities. So at the beginning, we have the cold start problem. So we solve that by having these communities, local communities using SweatPals as an operating system, because it's solving their payments, liability waivers, all the things that Mandy talked about during her pitch. And once we have about five to 10, we learned, then the network effects start to kick in. And it's, it is the model after Uber, but honestly not as capital intensive. It's not hard to get people passionate about this business, what we've learned. And our, our goal is that we, we do that, then one of the community leaders in the community in that city will be kind of promoted into SweatPal city manager. We already have uh, ambassadors reaching out people in Austin who are in Denver, Boulder, we have Miami. We have uh, 15 communities in LA right now using SweatPals and it's not us, we are not there even. Uh, so having that operating system and then leaning into the uh, network effects and leading traffic from other event sites would be our, our kind of playbook. And we're gonna launch Miami next and we have Denver and Boulder and LA and then we want to launch multiple cities at once so we can really scale it. And so that's on the first part. On the second part, regarding the KPIs, we consider each active community as having a minimum of 20 members, one event per week at least, and having one engagement in their group chat. That's what we count as active community. So those 200 that Mandy talked about, they all meet these criteria. So that's the KPI we're gonna, we're gonna as long as we get people to these communities, we are successful. So as long as these bookings happen, we are successful. So that's the KPI we are tracking. And on the uh, capital intensive side, uh, so I talked a lot about Uber, so they have GMs and CMs. So we, we're, we're gonna need those city managers too, 
but we already are generating uh, revenue, even though we are very early. And those 15K per month in, in GMV or 12K revenue that Mandy mentioned, it's all from the volume of experiences people are booking, and we see the next step for us would be subscriptions. So something like, you know, kind of in between class pass and uh, where you're gonna be pay for sweat pass premium and unlock all these events for free and get priority access to them. And that's gonna we see that where it's not gonna change the current experience, but if someone wants something more, that's gonna really scale us up uh, on the revenue side. I'm, I'm gonna follow up just real quick. So, so what do you specifically think that you need to achieve in order to raise a series A round from a traction standpoint? Yeah. Uh, we believe we need uh, at least two more cities uh, to, have, to, have to prove that market in two different markets. So yes, Austin is great. It's very active, very young. And uh, it's, it was great to start with. The people are forgiving. But we prove in Miami and on the West Coast we can achieve this. And we show that we can generate this, uh, even on a small scale, the subscriptions. We have, we, we have been talking to some, just as a you know, start, some VCs about this. And this was the feedback they gave us for Series A. Yeah. Thank you. Great. Salar so, Mandy, thank you very thank much. You. Thank you. You guys can hang out backstage. Thank you, judges. No, it was perfect. I couldn't have gone better. I'm ready for the tequila. <laughs> thank you, judges. We have one founder left competing. Are you ready to watch the video story talking about them? Please enjoy this package about Henry Arrowwood from FarmShare, everyone. Really, since the dawn of civilization, we've always had like very close connection to where our food is coming from. We've known the people that are growing our food, that are raising our food. And we're living at a point in time in the 21st century where there's such distance between us and what we buy at the grocery store. We think that something is fundamentally broken here. And so we really recognize this opportunity to strengthen that community and to strengthen that relationship between consumers and where their food is coming from. I'm Henry Arrowood, I'm the founder of FarmShare, and we're an online farmer's market connecting food producers directly with consumers nationwide. My background is in e-commerce, so I had a lot of exposure to like the inner workings and the mechanics of how e-commerce industry worked. And during the pandemic, I left San Francisco and I moved to a cattle ranch in Montana. Sort of a spontaneous decision, but my fiance and I were really into Yellowstone at the time and we decided that's where we would go. And literally before and after my day job, talking with Shopify and Stripe, I was serving as a ranch hand on this ranch. So rolling out hay bales on horseback, tagging cattle, like the whole nine. Got that one down there to tag. And that one over there, she's still working. <laughs> It became clear to me as I became intimately familiar with beef that there was some major inefficiencies that were plaguing that industry. These independent ranchers that I was working with, they just weren't making what they used to make. And as agriculture became more and more corporatized, it was really shutting down these small ag businesses throughout the country. I'd seen how direct-to-consumer e-commerce had revolutionized so many other businesses and created more streamlined direct-to-market distribution, but agriculture has been sidelined. And I really see what we're doing as not only a, a infrastructure to help these small ag producers survive, but also to thrive and to bring a resurgence of you know, agriculture as a viable small business. And for the customers, the value was us providing all the benefits of a farmer's market, like transparency and traceability into where your food is coming from and connection to who's producing it. We could provide all of that, but within the construct of convenience that the modern consumer has come to demand. We don't use any synthetics, no chemicals, no hormones, no implants, and everything here is non-GMO and soy free. I live here uh, with my wife and my three kids. Our hang-up is getting the product to you as conveniently as possible for you. Bye. And that's where FarmShare comes in because that relieves us of a lot of uh, a lot of stress of figuring out how to market our product. I can spend more time out here with the cattle, doing what I love. Hi, Shelby. We're really excited to be able to offer that product um, to you guys uh, nationwide. And to help you guys have more access and availability to great fresh farm raised food. We're at the beginning of the road here. We have 650 producers in queue right now that want to be part of FarmShare. 
We need some resourcing to stack behind the huge demand that we see from the suppliers trying to get onto our platform. Secondly, we really want to focus on establishing a physical presence with the community that exists today. We want to be there with the producers and help them to direct those customers to their farm share store online. And so that they're not waiting just for that third Saturday of every month to connect with that customer, but they can connect with that customer at any time, anywhere. I was always the kid that was tinkering. I was always the kid that was ideating. I was always the kid that was thinking about how things could be different. I have a tattered past of side hustles and uh, sort of, you know, things that I, that I tried and experimented with. I always knew that one of those was gonna take off and become my full-time gig. The inception of FarmShare really came at the intersection of a lot of my working experience coinciding with this sort of random life experience I had moving to a ranch in Montana. And it was at the convergence of, of these two that I really felt uniquely positioned to make a difference and to really change and reshape the future of food. We're gonna close yeah. it out, bring it in. Yeah. Your fiance's Let's go. in the crowd, you can't miss Fuck her. Yeah. <laughs> Without further ado, please welcome our final founder, Pitchy Henry Arrowwood from FarmShare. You ready? Good luck. Thank you. I want to start by asking the audience a question. Raise your hand if you like going to farmers markets. Throw them up. Pretty much everybody. It's good. Um, I'm going to guess that you probably like farmers markets for the quality, or maybe it's the connection. There's a whole host of reasons. I love farmers markets too. The reason why I love farmers markets the most, though, is because of the fair financials they provide to small American farmers. But farmers markets are limited. They're both regional and seasonal, and not everybody can participate. I want to tell you a story about my friend Sawyer Cottrell, who you actually saw here in the video. He is a first-generation rancher in Ena, Illinois. Ena, Illinois is a town of less than 3,000 people. His family produces a very high-quality American Wagyu, a product which I imagine most of the audience here tonight values. But people in Ena, they don't really care. And so Sawyer and his family, they don't have an option to sell to their local market. If they want to sell direct to consumer, they have to drive to Chicago. But that's five hours away. Now, you're probably thinking to yourself, well, Sawyer, he's got options. He could sell into Whole Foods. He could sell into Kroger. He could sell into Albertsons. But that system is fundamentally broken. When you go to the grocery store, the average dollar that you spend, only 14 cents makes its way back into Sawyer's pocket. That product you buy has changed hands on average seven times. We have seen e-commerce wash over this country. We've seen entire industries be revolutionized. Small businesses in the wake of the pandemic have benefited from Etsy and Shopify, but agriculture, for the most part, has been sidelined. Until now. FarmShare is building the infrastructure for small American farms to sell online for the first time. In October, we launched a beta with 50 producers from across the country. We had salmon fishermen in Alaska. We had Sawyer and his family in Illinois. We had tropical fruit growers in Florida and a bunch in between. And during this beta, we were able to successfully prove value we were creating for both sides of the market. For the producers, it was a cost-effective and convenient channel for them to get their product direct to market. They didn't have to schlep their product hours into the closest city. They didn't have to sit at a booth all day in hopes that they could sell their product to some passerby. We leveraged third-party logistics to pick up products directly from their farms and send it directly to consumers. And those consumers, well, for them, we provided all the value of the farmer's market, that connection, that quality. We provided all of that 
but with the convenience that all of us modern consumers demand. During our beta, we generated interest from over 650 producers from around the country. This $500,000 goes directly to bringing those producers online. Right now, we're squarely focused on the more than $10 billion opportunity that exists in direct-to-consumer farm sales. But our vision does not stop there. The future of farm share is a future where we're providing the infrastructures to help small ag businesses across this country manage their end-to-end -end life cycle, to capture a more than $100 billion opportunity. You know, 100 years ago, more than 20% of this country was farmers in some capacity. Today, that number is less than 2%. Small American farms are dying. They're being engulfed by big ag, who prioritize profits over our health, over our animals, over our planet. Today, you all, have an opportunity to join FarmShare in our mission to revolutionize and reshape the future of food, to extend the desperately needed lifeline to those small American farmers who are the backbone of our country, who care about our health, who care about our animals, who are true stewards of our land. And FarmShare is on a mission to empower these small farmers. And we're on a mission to provide all of you consumers with easy access to responsible food that you can trust and you can know your farmer and you can shake the hand that feeds you. No more mystery meat, no more waxed apples. Buy better food straight from the farm. Thank you. Great job, Henry. Good work. Keep it going for Henry. Judges, uh, what do you got? Yeah, I'll take this one. Um, great presentation. Uh, you know, really love the focus on giving awareness to uh, you know the the ag producers, and um, you know it's uh, it's something that a lot of consumers don't really uh, appreciate. I think um, where they're getting their food from, and they just go to the supermarket and you know assume it just shows up there magically. Um, and so uh, I just wanted to ask a, a question on uh, as you scale. Um, you know, you're, you're dealing with a lot of uh, rural farmers, you know, across the nation. How do you uh, plan to manage consistency across, you know, the, the network um, and the user experience? You know, you're transporting uh, a lot of um, perishables and, you know, want to make sure that the customers who are using farm shares have a good experience. Yeah, it's a great question. First off, I'll, I'll cover on the, uh, the perishable nature of our business. It's honestly a huge blocker prohibiting most small ag producers from even, even entertaining the idea of selling online. What we've been able to do is really demystify that process for them. We've worked with multiple manufacturers across the ecosystem to find not only the most robust packaging, but also packaging that really aligns with our core missions. All of our packaging is curbside recyclable and biodegradable. So that's one. That's tremendously hard for a small ag business who has so much else going on to try and figure out. And like I said, we've created a standard process around that to really help them. Secondly, we've created accessibility to rates with UPS and FedEx that make this business channel viable for them. So our rates on average are 85% cheaper than what would otherwise be accessible to these producers. In terms of consistency, you know, it's a big question we have to ask ourselves, and we think about it a lot. Um, at the end of the day, we're a marketplace. We believe that the, the natural hand of the market will dictate, you know, what thrives and survives on our platform. The crowd reviewing nature of our platform will really weed out those bad actors early. But in any sort of marketplace business like this, whether it be Etsy or Amazon, there's only so much you can do at, at the beginning. And so what we've really focused on are putting in those safeguards and those checks and balances. So if there's something that we can't catch from the onboarding process of that producer, we can catch it on their first or second customer experience, and we can knock them out of the system pretty quickly. Thank you.
Is that good? All right. All right, guys, make some more noise for Henry, please. Henry, if I could ask you to stay out yeah, here. Yeah, I got to come over here. Uh, you come over here. Come over this way. Can we, let's invite all the founders on the stage right now. Everybody, come on out. Make some noise for all the founders that pitched tonight. You guys want to take center stage? Deservedly so. How excited are you guys to be done? <laughs> the judges have a very, very hard decision in front of them. We are going to take five minutes for the judges to deliberate a little bit. Uh, if you want to get a drink, stay close. It's going to be a quick deliberation as they go over it. We're going to get back to it. I'm going to kick to the audience at home. That is it. All five founders have pitched. When we come back, we are going to announce the winner of the Barn Burner, everyone. Stay tuned. Okay, this will literally be 30 seconds, but we first wanted to bring you guys in here, like, off stage and say we were, like, blown away by how well everybody did. We think you guys are all awesome, and despite, like, the outcomes here, we all want to help out and, like, provide introductions to our networks. To reiterate, I think I shared with a bunch of you in our meetings that there's going to be additional events coming up and we're going to make sure that every single person has an opportunity to mm -hmm. to get exposure to additional cool. capital. Yeah, so, thank you for that. Too. Yeah, thank you all genuinely, genuinely want to help. Thank you all did well. Yeah, yeah thank you. And, and thanks so much for having, like, giving us an opportunity that's based on effort to yeah. get to the five. Yeah. 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 Like, yeah. That doesn't exist yeah. anywhere in yeah. investment. Yeah. Right. Probably shouldn't keep the audience yeah. waiting too long. Cool. Cool. Awesome cool. job. Welcome back, everyone tuning in at home. Boulder Theater, please make some noise. We are back for the final portion of the evening. This is the moment we've all been waiting for. Judges, I know you went down to the green room. You've been deliberating. Please tell me how that went, how hard that was. I don't, I don't envy you at all. Yeah, happy to start. I mean, first and foremost, like this is an incredible, you know, high-quality group. Um, I think we've all judged competitions in the past, and. Speaking for myself, this is by far the highest quality that I've ever seen in this you know, format, and it's uh, really a... Absolutely. Uh, unbelievable from, from all the teams. Um, I'll also you know, reinforce the point that you made earlier, which is that we have a huge information advantage working with these teams over the course of you know, the past couple of weeks, and that's critically important because we're investing real capital from our funds into these businesses, and we've done you know, fairly extensive due diligence to, to get to this point. Um, but all of these opportunities always reinforce the deep respect that I have for founders. Um, you know, a tiny percentage of our population is willing to actually take the plunge and build companies and solve real problems, and we absolutely need them to. Um, so agnostic of the result, I think I, I speak for the panel in saying that we're happy to support these entrepreneurs you know, going forward. Totally, and, uh, totally, okay. totally. Uh, you, yeah, just a, a little point on, on that note. Uh, one of the things I'm excited about having met with all of the founders is that we're actually going to invite them to pitch to our syndicate as well. So those who don't win tonight are still going to have an opportunity to get funding and going to get in front of a number of different angel investment groups and early stage VCs as well in the coming weeks. So Dude. just because they're not <laughs> winning tonight, <laughs> we're looking forward to helping them on the journey. And that's everybody on the panel. You know, and as we heard, they all are going to need to raise more capital. So in their future rounds, uh, we, we'll, we'll be there. We'll be looking for them. Make some noise for the judges, everybody. This could, couldn't be a better group. That's very cool. Uh, I think we're going Oscar style. Kara, you have an envelope that you'd like to present to me, right? And I don't want any gaffes. This isn't like a fake envelope, but I got the wrong movie. All right, guys, I'm going to put this down. This is going to be for the founder to say a few words after I've announced the winner. Make some noise for all of the founders that pitched tonight. And for the judges who will continue to support them on their journey. Oh, wow. Okay. Uh, this is unprecedented, mostly because this is the first time we've done it, but still. We have a tie, everyone. We have a tie. We have two winners tonight of the Barn Burner competition. 
Sweat Pals, and Grapefruit. Please come on out, Sweat Pals and Grapefruit. Make some noise. Wow. Congratulations. Uh, where are you guys going to cash that thing together? I have to ask, I just, I, tell, me, tell me how it feels, tell me what this means to your company. It means, it means we are going to spread to uh, uh, Boulder and it means we're going to, yeah, I mean it means, it means the world to us and we are not going to take this for granted and we're going to give this everything we have to make sure Sweat Pals is a household name. Essentially. I love it. I love it. Same, same exact question. Yeah, I, I, I'm, I'm trying to figure this all out in my head right now. But I, I, we were saying, we were talking backstage a little bit in just the, the opportunity to be one of five based on effort, which in fundraising and startups never happens. So all the founders, you know, past, present, future founders, a lot of times there's a lot of things out of your control. But to get to the five was our effort, and uh, to be one of the, the winners is like exceptionally special, especially with this core. Like, I, I don't know, this is wild. This is absolutely awesome. Thank you so, so much. This is gonna make a, a major difference in our business. Thank you. Anything you'd like to say about what this means to you? I think it's also a, a validation that people really love Sweat Pals. And we came a long way with all the votes <laughs> that we generated from our sweat pals from Austin and all the cities that we launched to. And we can't wait to spread sweat pals to more cities. One more time, congratulations to sweat pals and grapefruit. That is our show. I'd like to invite all the founders out to stage. Round of applause for all the founders. Judges, if you would like to come on stage as well, round of applause for the judges. Thank you to everyone watching at home. Thank you to all of the founders. Thank you to our in-house audience. That is Barnburner. Everybody on behalf of Sweater, good night to you. See you again. <laughs>